Okay, good afternoon. Um, in today's lecture, we are talking about lying about one's preferences. Because this is a topic that we have somewhat neglected so far. So I did mention it in the second, and no, actually in the, f in the first lecture, I did mention strategy proofness to some extent. So there we made the assumption that from then on, we will, for simplicity, assume that we know the agent's preferences or that the social choice function can just take as an input the preferences of the agents. But as we have seen in the, in the first lecture already, so there are some cases where agents are actually better off by misstating their preferences. And today's lecture will be completely devoted to lying about one's preferences or the axiom of strategy proofness, which exactly rules this kind of lying out. And the main result of today's lecture will be an impossibility theorem called the gibbard Sethathwaite impossibility theorem. So it's uh, somewhat uh, related to the error impossibility theorem. Um, and one nice thing about the proof is, is that uh, we can actually reduce this new impossibility theorem to the error impossibility theorem, which makes the proof uh, somewhat easier. And um, in the second part of the lecture, we will also have a short segment about strategic manipulation by abstention. And this is also something we, I think, have very briefly discussed in the first lecture. So this is about somebody not going to an election, so not taking part in an election and then being better off by doing that. So it can be seen as a special kind of strategic manipulation. All right, so maybe let's first recap a little bit what we know about strategy proofness so far, because I, I did mention that in the um, first and in the third lecture, we had some results on strategy proofness, and from then on, we basically ignored um, strategic manipulation. So first thing that we did formally was in lecture three, and there we have seen that if we have only two alternatives, so we started with social choice from pairs, then strategy proofness is equivalent to monotonicity if you only consider um, resolute social choice functions. So this was a, like a little lemma or theorem that we, that we proved in the lecture. So the standard notion of monotonicity is completely equivalent to strategy proofness. Um, as a consequence, uh, for two alternatives, we have very positive results. So there are many functions that satisfy monotonicity for only two alternatives. Um, Perhaps the most natural one is, is majority rule for two alternatives. So if we have two alternatives, we can just do majority rule, and this function satisfies strategy proofness. So nobody is better off by lying about their preferences. Then, uh, when we looked at restricted domains, uh, which I think was, yeah, so it says it's there, so it was in lecture five. Um, then we had a statement, so there was one slide devoted to strategy proofness, and we had a statement that taking the maximal elements is a strategy proof social choice function in all subdomains in which the majority relation is guaranteed to be transitive. Okay, so if, if the majority relation is transitive, then there are always maximal elements with respect to the majority relation. Um, if we have a strict majority relation, as in the case of tournaments, this means exactly that there's a Condorcet winner, and just taking this Condorcet winner will always result in a strategy proof function. But of course, in general, um, it's not guaranteed that the majority relation is transitive, so this only applies to restricted domains where this is the case. Um, so, in particular, we had um, the domain of dichotomous preferences, in which approval voting satisfies very nice properties and it returns the Condorcet winner. So, approval voting um, is strategy proof within the domain of dichotomous preferences because of that statement that we had there. And also, median voting in the domain of single peak preferences is an example of a strategy proof social choice function. Um, one theorem that I would like to mention in particular, which is not stated on this slide here, is, is that for this particular domain of, of uh, preference profiles that lead to a transitive majority relation, we even had a complete characterization. So I think that was only for the case of an odd number of voters and strict preferences. There was this theorem by Campbell and Kelly, which showed that the max function, taking the maximal elements, and if there's an odd number of voters with strict preferences, that means there can only be exactly a Condorcet winner in each feasible set. So always returning this Condorcet winner is the only function that is strategy proof, um, non-dictatorial, and uh, Pareto optimal, I think. And this was all restricted to resolute functions. So that was a complete characterization which directly led to this max, led to this max function. But of course, uh, the most interesting question now is since we have now studied many social choice functions that are defined in the general domain, not in the restricted domain of dichotomous or single peak preferences, but in the general domain, let's say the general domain of strict preferences, just for simplicity, it would be nice to know which of the functions that we have studied so far are actually strategy proof. 
let's say, in the domain of strict preferences, just to make things simpler. Um, so by, by concrete functions, I, I mean, for instance, these uh, scoring rules, for instance, or we had all these majoritarian functions, top cycle, UC, um, banks, the bipartisan set from last week, for instance. Uh, for scoring rules, we have seen an example in the very first lecture where I showed you that plurality and I think also borders rule can be strategically manipulated. So for those, we had negative results. Um, and if you think about the other functions, particular things like the top cycle or the uncovered set, which in general return a relatively large number of alternatives, it turns out that this question is, is somewhat ill-defined, right? Because when we introduced strategy proofness, we made this restricting assumption that we are only able to compare singletons to each other, even though in general a social choice function can return more than one alternative. And things like the top cycle will in almost all cases return more than one alternative. So we have seen that most of these majoritarian functions, top cycle, UC, banks, TEQ, and bipartisan set, yield a single alternative if and only if there is a Condorcet winner. In all other cases, there's more than one alternative. So the problem that we have is that our definition of strategy proofness, which only allows to compare singletons to each other, is most reasonable for functions that are resolute. But uh, what do I mean by most reasonable? So of course, it's still well-defined for set-valued functions. But whenever a function returns more than one alternative, the outcome is incomparable by the definition of strategy proofness that we made um, to any other set that could be returned. And, and that means, in other words, that if we have a social choice function, I think I mi might have mentioned it when we talked about strategy proofness earlier on, if we have a function that always returns at least two alternatives, this function is strategy proof by definition because we are not able to compare sets of alternatives to each other. Um, at the same time, all the functions that we studied are not resolute. So there are always, always some cases, even rules like borders rule or plurality, they, they can result in ties, and then we would return several alternatives. So of course, we can like, break ties. So for scoring rules, for instance, it's somewhat natural to just, for instance, use lexicographic tie breaking, which means that you just take the alternative that comes earliest in the alphabet in, in case you have several winners. Um, but uh, still, th this basic conflict remains that we are talking about set-valued functions, but the notion of strategy proofness that we have defined is, is most reasonable for, for singleton um, outcomes, which means for resolute social choice functions. And um, of course, we can completely give up resoluteness by just breaking ties in some way, but then we do know, I think that was also in some lecture, lecture three, um, we do know that resoluteness is incompatible with anonymity and neutrality. So, th so that means if we are breaking ties in all cases in order to have a resolute function, this function will violate anonymity or neutrality or maybe even both of these properties. So I in order to study strategy proofness, so there are basically two different approaches, or at least two approaches that we are following in the rest of this course. The first one is that we enforce resoluteness, as I just described. So we talk about resolute functions, which means that we, in some cases, have to give up anonymity and neutrality by just uh, breaking ties in some way, so that in the end, that uh, the function that we are looking at is a function that always returns a single winner. So this function could still be inspired or based on set-valued functions like the top cycle or the uncovered set by saying that we always pick an element from the uncovered set, but these resolute functions will always pick a single alternative. Okay, so that's, that's one approach, and once we have this approach, then strategy proofness is it's completely clear how to define it because we are only comparing singletons to each other, and this is exactly what the preferences of the voters are defined for. So they are defined for comparing alternatives. And the other approach which we are, uh, with which we are dealing next week is to redefine strategy proofness for irresolute social choice functions. So if we return sets, rather than just saying the tie-breaking is uh, is well specified and known to all the voters, we leave some uncertainty there. So for instance, you could imagine that we have something like a uniform lottery over all alternatives in the top cycle or all alternatives in the uncovered set. Or maybe a lottery and the, the agents don't know the exact probabilities at attached to these alternatives. Or for instance, one other example of uncertainty would be that there is a tie-breaking ordering, like the lexicographic tie-breaking ordering, but the agents don't know what the ordering is. So th there's some ordering over the alternatives, and whenever there's a tie, then according to this ordering, a single alternative is chosen, but the, the voters don't know what the ordering is. And this uncertainty can be exploited um, so that 
there are only fewer applications of manipulation, and that allows us to, to prove that some functions are strategy proof and we get, we get some more positive results because a manipulation only counts as a manipulation if a voter is really better off um, um, no matter what the tie-breaking actually does. So, but this is something that we are going to discuss next week. This week it's very simple, so we just focus on resolute functions. Okay. So now, um, the first thing that uh, comes uh, in quite handy is, to, is a, a strengthening of the monotonicity condition that we know already. And then the like, first little result will be that we show that this strengthened monotonicity condition is for resolute social choice functions equivalent to strategy proofness for any number of alternatives. So we have seen that the monotonicity notion that we have discussed so far is equivalent to strategy proofness for the two alternative case or in the two alternative case. And the stronger condition is equivalent to strategy proofness for any number of alternatives. And um, if you recall, so we had these differing domains that we were working on. Um, so in, in the beginning, we had even weak preferences. Um, and then at one point, when we introduced scoring rules, we also allowed for a variable electorate. So the, this, the numbers of voters was allowed to change because we had axioms like consistency. And for this part of the lecture, we will take a step backwards and then we will look at the domain DLIN, which is the domain of strict preferences and there's always a fixed electorate. So the number of voters, just like in the beginning of this course when we, for instance, discussed errors in possibility is fixed. So there's uh, a set capital N of voters um, because we don't need to, to fiddle around with the set of voters at this point. Okay, so what does this strong monotonicity condition that we are working with say? So here's the definition. So a social choice function is strongly monotonic if the following holds. So let me walk you through this. Um, so this is already the consequence. So I think it is easier to write it up this way. So in the end, we have two pref So we have this condition is a condition for two preference profiles. And the consequence is, is that the choice sets are the same for both of these preference profiles. Note that this definition is not only for resolute functions. We will later also use it for irresolute functions. So the definition is even allows for sets. Um, but for the following statements, we will only use the special case uh, applied to resolute functions. So what we have here is we have two preference profiles that are completely identical, except that for one voter i, the preference between two alternatives x and y differ. So in the original preference profile, voter i prefers x to y, and in the new preference profile, the voter prefers y to x. Okay, and the only thing we know about x and y is that x was not in the choice set in the original preference profile. Okay, so we have a preference profile, and then maybe let's draw a figure somewhere. So then some set of alternatives is chosen, f of r. And then we have two alternatives, x and y, and the only thing that we know about these two alternatives is that x is not in the set here, it was not chosen. And what's happening to x is that x is actually weakened against y, right? So we have two alternatives that, that are because this pairwise comparison is the only thing that changes. So x was on top of y, and now in this new preference profile, y is on top of x. So in other words, we are taking an unchosen alternative, which is somewhere here, and we are making it weaker. Okay, so either against a chosen alternative or against another unchosen alternative. So because we didn't say what y is, so y could be in here or somewhere here. Both of these cases are possible. The only thing that is fixed is that x is unchosen, so it's somewhere here. Maybe let's also insert x here. So what this condition then says is, so if we have a preference profile and we take an unchosen alternative and we make it weaker against some other alternative, then the choice set is not affected at all. Okay, and we can also use this repeatedly so this is only for one pairwise comparison, but we can also make this unchosen alternative x weaker and weaker and weaker by doing lots of pairwise switches in the preference relation of this voter i, and for instance, move it all the way to the, to, to the bottom of this preference ranking of, of voter i. Okay, and also by repeatedly using it, we can also apply it to other alternatives. So in general, what we are doing here is that we are making unchosen alternatives weaker, and then the consequences is that the choice set is invariant. So it doesn't change if we make some unchosen alternative weaker. 
Um, so as I said, so in the following, we will mostly focus on the resolute case, but since we are going to use the same axiom for irresolute functions, set-valued functions in the future, let's just see what this means for, um, say, for instance, majoritarian functions. Okay, so because we have worked with majoritarian functions quite a bit, so if you're looking at majoritarian functions, then th you can think of this as a tournament, and then subset th some subset of alternatives is selected, such as, such as the bipartisan set or the top cycle, for instance. And then the strong monotonicity condition means that we can weaken an unchosen alternative, for instance, against another unchosen alternative. And that would be the case if we have some y here, and then um, we are changing the preference between x and y. Right, so we're making x weaker against y. So at, at one point, since if we are restricting attention to majoritarian function, for instance, we can turn around the majority edge by doing this. If we do this to several voters in the preference profile. Okay, so uh, here you can already see that this condition implies um, what we have, uh, I think, in the last lecture called independence of unchosen alternatives. Because if we can make an unchosen alternative weaker as many times as we want against another unchosen alternative, it means that the choice set is invariant under changes between alternatives that are both unchosen. Okay, because we can take two unchosen alternatives, make one of them weaker against the other, and that just means we can completely fiddle around in, with the majority edges between those. And if, on the other hand, for instance, this other alternative y would have been a chosen alternative, then weaken, weakening an unchosen alternative against a chosen one for these majoritarian functions just means that... Um, Let's erase this here. That, for instance, we can turn around an edge that was originally ingoing there, a majority edge. We can turn this around to an, uh, make it an outgoing edge because we are making this unchosen alternative weaker until the majority relation switches there. Okay, so basically, what we can do in the majoritarian case is that we make the choice set stronger by adding additional majority edges going from the inside to the outside and turning around edges between unchosen alternatives. Okay. So here you can already see that this condition seems relatively strong because the consequence of all these operations is, is that the choice set doesn't change at all. Um, but there are functions, as we will see next week, that satisfy this condition in the set-valued case. So for instance, if you think about the top cycle, so we already know that switching the majority relation between unchosen alternatives doesn't affect the top cycle. And also, making the choice set stronger against unchosen alternatives, you can um, verify, also doesn't affect uh, what the top cycle is. So, it, um, well, the top cycle, in the top cycle case, it's really very simple because the top cycle al already only has outgoing edges anyway, right? So, if we change, if we make unchosen alternatives weaker against chosen ones, so what? So, it's the majority relation will be exactly as it used to be before. And interestingly, also other majoritarian functions, for instance, the uh, beloved uh, bipartisan set, also satisfies this condition, um, which is quite nice. Okay, but this is basically just a look ahead of what we are doing with this property uh, for irresolute functions. Okay, but I hope you, you do understand what this property means, right? So it's just saying that we take an alternative that was not chosen, we make it weaker, and then um, the choice set is completely the same. Okay, so strong monotonicity wouldn't be called strong monotonicity if it's not stronger than monotonicity. That's not completely obvious if you look at this definition, and therefore it is an exercise. So it, it can be shown, it's not too difficult, that this condition is really stronger than the monotonicity condition that you are used to. So the one that you are used to, just to remind you, says if x is in the choice set and we make x stronger, then x is still in the choice set. Okay, so it's, it's different in several respects, so we are not weakening an unchosen alternative, rather we are making a chosen alternative stronger, and also the consequence is only that x is still chosen, not that the choice set is exactly the same. Okay, so it, it differs in two respects here. Okay, but uh, now I would like to focus on the resolute case. Okay, and for the resolute case, I don't know where I have enough space, maybe here on the right-hand side, um, for the resolute case, we know that the function, uh, when, or when we talk about choice set, we always have a singleton, so only one alternative is chosen. Okay, so that means we have this preference ranking of voter i, and somewhere in this ranking we have alternative x. Okay, and this is the only alternative that is chosen. And then there are some alternatives on top of x, 
and some alternatives that are below x. Okay, and now if we talk about weakening an unchosen alternative, um, that allows for several things here. So the only thing that is changing is the preference relation of voter i, or the ranking of voter i. So if we weaken an unchosen alternative, we can take something that is on top of x here and move it a little bit down, right, from the top to here, for instance. And then the choice set should still be, be exactly the same. So it should still be singleton x after that. So that, for instance, allows for things like switching, in this example here, the top two positions. Where we can make the top alternative weaker than the second alternative, then we have switched those two, um, the choice set shouldn't change at all. Right? So or more generally, everything that is on top of x, we can just move around arbitrarily as long as those alternatives stay on top of x. Is this clear? Um, OK, and then um, what we can also do is we can weaken an unchosen alternative like anyone down here. Um, oh, OK, no, a. Sorry, so when I just said so, as they have to stay on top of x, that's not really necessary. You can actually move them below x, right? Because uh, if you weaken an unchosen alternative, you can take something up here and also move it down there. That's also fine. Okay, so if you just so if you take some y which is on top here, you can you can move it all the way down, and then you have still only weakened an unchosen alternative, and then the consequences that still singleton x is chosen. And you can also rearrange the alternatives that are below x, because those are also unchosen, only x is chosen. And we can, for instance, take this one and move it down here, or this one down here, so, and that allows for a complete reordering of all the alternatives that are below x. Okay, so what we can do is we can take alternatives up here, move them anywhere, including down there. We can rearrange the alternatives that are below x. The only thing that we are not allowed to do is um, is to take an alternative from down here and move it on top of x. Okay, so that we cannot do. And that gives us this special case of strong monotonicity for resolute social choice functions, um, which is stated down here. So here again, we have two preference profiles, r and r prime. We have one single voter. Um, and this is the only voter for which the preference relation actually changes. So the preferences of all the other voters are the same. And then we have that only x is selected, and then we have this condition here, which says that everything, every alternative z that was below x in the original preference relation is still below x in the modified preference relation. If that is the case, then x should still be uniquely selected. Okay, and I'm claiming, as I hopefully convinced you by having this example here, or this figure basically, it's not really an example, um, is equivalent to the definition up here only restricted to the case of resolute social choice functions. Okay, because in all these cases, we are only making an unchosen alternative, which is anything except x, weaker against another unchosen alternative. Um, okay, so the only thing that we cannot do is make x weaker, and that would be the case if we move something from below here on top of x, then we have made x weaker than another alternative, and this is not covered by strong monotonicity. So this, maybe let's use blue here. Um, so basically this set here in economics is called the lower contour set. Um, so if you have a preference relation, it's just the set of alternatives that are below a given alternative. So here the given alternative is x, and we say that everything that is below x uh, is called the lower contour set. And what this condition here means is that the lower contour set can only increase in size, so it can, or it can actually only grow. So everything that is in the lower contour set remains in the lower contour set, um, but there can also be additional alternatives in the lower contour set, and that would be the case if we move something that is on top of x below here. Okay, that would still be covered by strong monotonicity. So what this condition, again, means is that if x is chosen uniquely, so we are talking about resolute functions, and, every th and then we change the preference profile, um, because here strong monotonicity is only for one pairwise comparison, but as I said earlier, we can apply it repeatedly. So we change the preference profile such that everything that, is, that was below x is still below x, well, then x still needs to be chosen. Okay? In, in fact, uniquely chosen, because we are talking about resolute functions. 
And that allows for much more changes um, than, or many more changes than what the old notion of monotonicity allowed for. for. For old monotonicity, it was only the case that if X was chosen and we strengthen it against some other alternative, then X should still be chosen. But this, for instance, allows for rearranging alternatives below X in an arbitrary way. Okay, so therefore you can already see that it's, that it's much stronger. And as it is stated here already, um, so this condition will be most useful in cases where, we, for instance, we know that for some preference profile, X is the chosen alternative. Um, and then that, for instance, means if we take the same preference profile and we move X all the way to the top, then X is still the unique winner. Okay? Or we can also take some other alternative, which is on top of X, and move that one to the top of the preference ranking. So in many cases, we just move alternatives to the top of the ranking. And if we move X or anything that is on top of X, uh, to the top of the entire ranking, then the choice set is not affected because of strong monotonicity. Is that clear? Okay. Um, okay, so this is the definition of strong monotonicity. And now let's see what we are going to do with it. Um, so it eventually will be helpful for proving this gibbard satterthwaite impossibility theorem that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the lecture. But first we are going to prove a statement that is known as the muller satterthwaite theorem. It's not an impossibility, it's just a characterization. Because this theorem said, as I mentioned earlier, that for resolute social choice functions, strategy proofness is completely equivalent to strong monotonicity. Okay, so both, both, definition, both conditions are identical, basically, or equivalent to each other logically. And that means that if you want to reason about strategy proof social choice functions, um, then we can just use uh, strong monotonicity instead of strategy proofness, because, because they are equivalent. OK, and this theorem I'm going to show you here by writing down the proof. OK, so we want to show that strategy proofness and this notion of strong monotonicity are the same thing. From now on, we are in the realm of resolute functions. So no more sets. There's always a unique winner. So first thing is to write down these two definitions. Um, and there we can already see that they are somewhat similar uh, in terms of the definition, because both of these conditions refer to two preference profiles, R and R prime, which only differ in the preference relation of one single voter, voter I. Um, and then we are saying something about the choice sets um, that are taken from both of these preference profiles. So let's first write down what these two conditions have in common. So we have two preference profiles, R and R prime. Okay, then there is some voter I in the set capital N, such that the preference relations of all other voters, J, are the same. And the only thing that differs is um, what voter I thinks about those alternatives. Okay, and now let's first write down the definition of strategy proofness. So, which I think is good anyway, because th when we defined it, that was already some time ago. I um, guess that was in lecture three when we talked about the two alternative case. Um, but strategy proofness is a very intuitive uh, condition. So strategy proofness, if, as you hopefully remember, just says no voter should be better off by lying about his or her preferences. So that means for any choice that we have for these two preference rela re relations of voter I, so because these are the original preference relations and the one in the modified preference profile prime, it should not be the case. So strategy proofness is always, uh, by definition, has this negation in there because we, we don't want this social choice function de to be manipulable. It should not be the case that the outcome for the modified preference profile is strictly preferred according to the true preferences of voter I to the original outcome. Okay, so this is the definition of strategy proofness, and I, I hope so. It's, it's basically just what we had a couple of weeks ago. So this is what the outcome originally was, and by misstating his or her preferences, this voter I gets something that she strictly prefers to the original outcome. Okay, so, and that should not be the case. Um, 
Okay, so that's strategy proofness, and now let's compare strong monotonicity to that. No, it's ugly. Okay, and here we will take the second version of this definition, which was already tailor-made for resolute functions. Okay, so both of them are equivalent, of course, but um, for these resolute functions, we said that there, uh, for these two variants of the preferences of voter i, the following should be the case. If in the original preference profile the outcome was singleton x, and, and now I'm just repeating this definition that we had on the slide, everything that was below, uh, the everything that yeah, was below x is still below x in this new preference profile. So for every um, z we have that if x was strictly on top of z, then the same is true in this new modified prime relation. If this is the case, so this specifies how the new preference profile is related to the old one, um, then the outcome should still be singleton x. Okay. And the job of this proof now is to prove that these two conditions are equivalent to each other. So for these equivalence results, as almost always, we are going to split them up into two different implications. So first we show that strategy proofness implies strong monotonicity. That's the simpler part. And then um, in the second step, we are going to show that uh, strong monotonicity implies strategy proofness. Okay, um, so we want to show that this condition implies that condition. Okay, so um, in general, when working with conditions like strategy proofness and also monotonicity or strong monotonicity, it's useful to work with the negation of these properties. For instance, in the case of strategy proofness, it's already defined as a negated property. So it's, it's quite useful to assume for contradiction in the first case here that strong monotonicity is violated and that that would result in a contradiction. So we assume for contradiction, so AFC is just short because I'm lazy for assume for contradiction, that, okay, and now we have, uh, since I'm lazy, I'm basically just copying this stuff here. <laughs> Okay, so that we assume for contradiction that all of this is the case except that, okay, so this I can write separately. So x is chosen uniquely and everything that was below x is still below x, but now we want to have that this uh, consequence of strong monotonicity is not true. Okay, so um, in the new preference profile, the function returns something different than x. Okay, and that, let's just call this other alternative because we're only talking about resolute functions. L let's this be alternative y, which is different from x. Okay, so this is just the negation of this line here. Okay. And now the only condition well, that we can use here because we're only working with two different axioms is strategy proofness. Okay, so we assume that for contradiction, st um, strong monotonicity is violated, and then we can now use strategy proofness. Okay, and what do we know from strategy proofness? So I claim there are two important consequences here. Um, so we can really basically just ignore this part now, um, at this point at least. So we have that the social choice function yields alternative x, and then we have another profile where only voter i changed her preferences, and now we have a different alternative y. Okay, now we want to, we know that this function should be strategy proof, so we know that according to the true preference relation, which is part of this profile here, this voter i should not, be pr uh, should not prefer y to x, because otherwise that would be a manipulation. Right, so originally this voter gets x, then she changes her preference relation, and then she gets alternative y, which would be better than x. Okay, so that should not be the case. So it should therefore not 
be the case that y is better to x according to the uh, standard preference relation. And since we are talking about strict preferences here, if y is not better than x, it has to be the case that x is better than y, okay? because there are no ties here in the preference relations. So we have x needs to be preferred to y in the original preference relation, because otherwise um, there would be a manipulation. And now let's say from which profile to which profile from R. So that means R is the true preference uh, relation of uh, voter I, or the relation, the part of R that belongs to voter I is his true preference relation. And then this voter can lie and misstate the preferences as in R prime. Okay, so is this argument clear? Right, so if, if if this is not the case, then we would have y is, is better than x, and then this would clearly be a manipulation. So you get, you get x, then you misstate your preferences, and then you get y. And if you prefer y to x, that's a manipulation. Okay. And now the interesting thing is we can it also do use the same argument in the other direction as well. Okay, so we have two preference profiles. Only voter i changed uh, her preference relation. In one profile we get x, and the other one we get y. We can also start with the preference profile r prime and assume that these are the true preferences of the voters. And then we have to make sure that whatever she gets if uh, the preferences are as in r should not be better um, than what she got in this prime preference profile. Okay, and by this arguing it should be the case that x should not be preferred to y in this prime profile, and since preferences are strict, that means that y should be preferred to x in this prime relation because otherwise there's a manipulation from r prime to r. Okay, so are both of these steps clear? Because that's really like, a, uh, like an elementary application of strategy proofness. So we have two profiles, the outcome changes from x to y, and we have to make sure that if the outcome changes from x to y, that the voter um, who got X in the original preference profile cannot misstate her preferences to get Y, which she likes better, and also the other way around. So we can go from R to R prime, and we can also go from R prime to prime. So it should not be the case that you got Y in the beginning, then you lie about your preferences, and then you get X, which you like better. And to rule out these preferences, um, that you get something that you like better, it is necessary that X is preferred to Y in this preference relation, and Y is preferred to X in that preference relation. Okay, and now claim this is already a contradiction. So the implication from strategy proofness to strong monotonicity case is done now. Why, why is that the case? Does anybody see why that would be? So I'm saying that these two statements about the two preference relations is in contradiction to an assumption that we made. Um, yes? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it's it's really maybe let's use the color here. So what you were referring to is this condition here. Okay. So I s said in the beginning we can ignore it for so for for these implications here this condition was not needed. But now in the end we get a contradiction of these two statements with that one here because here we say that if x was preferred to z in the original preference relation, then x should also be preferred to z in the prime relation. But here this is precisely not the case. Right. So this should hold for all alternatives z. But y is an alternative for which this doesn't hold. And therefore, this condition um, is violated, and we have a contradiction. Maybe let's make this a bit nicer. OK. OK, so these statements here are incompatible with this one here. That's not possible. OK, and now comes the interesting case, or the slightly, yeah, somewhat. So this case was also interesting, but the next one is the one um, which, which at least I think is more exciting. And that is to show that strong monotonicity implies strategy proofness. And here again, it's useful to uh, prove this by contradiction, so that means um, we assume that st strategy proofness is violated, and that's 
that's a natural approach here because, as I said, so there's a negation in the definition of strategy proofness. So it's quite natural to work with the negation of strategy proofness. So we assume again for contradiction that um, this voter I can manipulate, and that means in the original preference profile she got X, and then there's some other alternative Y, which she gets in the new preference profile. Okay, and to complete the manipulation, of course, she has to be better off um, in the new preference profile. So it has to be the case that she strictly prefers y to x. Okay, so this is exactly the negation of strategy proofness. So if something can be manipulated, this has to be the case. Um, okay, and now for, for this part of the proof, we are going to construct a new pr preference profile, but again, the only thing that changes are the preferences of voter I. And maybe here, let me first write down how this preference, this new preference profile is defined. So only voter I's preferences change, so we are changing the ranking of voter I. And I'm writing down the definition, and then you tell me what this operation actually does. So I think it's a nice exercise um, in reading uh, like mathematical notation in particular when you play around with relations which are just uh, sets of pairs of alternatives. So that's why we take set operations on these. So we are removing some tuples here. Zy for all alternatives Z that are different from Y. And we are adding some others namely the ones where the ordering is exactly the other way around. And again, this is for all set that are different from Y. Okay, now my question would be, what is this new relation here? Okay, um, so we, we have this original preference relation. We also have the relation with one prime here. This is a double prime relation. We take the original relation and then we are changing some pairs here. Um, and this is just a fancy notation for doing a rather simple operation, which I can also write down in words. What happens if we are changing these tuples here in this uh, set? Because the preference relation is nothing but a set. Yes? Exactly. Right. So we, whenever something is better than y, we remove this pair. And then we just add another pair where y is on top of z. And this is just, uh, as I said, like a fancy a mathematical way of saying that we are just moving y to, to the top. So alternatively, if I didn't want to, to bother, bother you with mathematical notation, I could have just written here, um, and I'm doing it now, <laughs> move y to the top. And otherwise, the preference relation doesn't change at all. Okay, so I think at this point it's useful maybe draw a figure here. Okay, so we have this preference relation. So we only need to look at the preferences of voter I because we now basically have three different profiles, but only voter I's preferences change. And now in this original preference relation, I'm going to write it down as a ranking, um, a very incomplete ranking, because the only thing that we know about this ranking here is that this voter strictly prefers y to x. Okay, so there we have some alternatives, so this dot is meant to be more uh, one or more or, or no alternatives. Then we have y somewhere, and then we have x somewhere, and so on. And in this preference profile, we know that alternative x is chosen. Right, so this is stated exactly here. And now in this new preference relation, double prime, the only thing that we have changed is we have moved y to the top. Okay. Um, so in this figure here, it would be y, and then maybe some other alternatives. Everything else remains the same, and x, and so on. Now, what I would like to know now is what can we say about the uh, choice in this new preference profile, double prime, where only the preferences of voter i change, and we ha have moved y to the top. Okay, and, and the only thing that we know about the function is that it satisfies strong monotonicity. 
what can we say about the choice from this new preference profile where all relations are the same except that voter i moved y to the top here. And we knew in the original profile x was chosen. And what about the new profile now? If we have strong monotonicity. We can also start writing it down here so we know that in preference profile R, X was chosen. Any? Yes, X is still chosen because of uh, strong monotonicity, right? So everything that stays below X is still below X. So and then also, as I said earlier on the slide, um, we will use strong monotonicity often by just moving something that is on top of X, and Y definitely is on top of X, by moving this alternative to the top. So strong monotonicity implies that in this new preference profile, X is still chosen. Okay, so that's fair enough. So here we can just denote this by this orange color here. So orange always refers to which alternative is chosen. Okay, and now there's still this other relation, which I neglected so far, with a single prime. Okay, so that was in the original assumption for this uh, manipulation that was the manipulated uh, preference profile. The only thing that we know about this preference profile here is that alternative Y is chosen from this profile. Okay, so if I write this down somewhere, we have Y somewhere here. Um, and the only thing that we know is that alternative Y is chosen. Um, we don't even know whether X is on top of Y or, or, or Y is on top of X. Um, that we don't know. And uh, now recall that we still want to derive a contradiction here. Okay, so we want to have a contradiction in the end. And now what I'm claiming is, is that if in this prime profile alternative Y is chosen, which it clearly is by this assumption here, then we can also use strong monotonicity to go from this preference relation to that preference relation um, and um, such that in, in the consequence Y still needs to be chosen for this preference profile here where voter I's preferences are just like this one here. And this requires quite a number of strong monotonicity assumptions because so the difference between this relation and that relation was just that my y was moved on top. So everything else remained in the same order. So for this preference relation, we don't know anything about the ordering here. So all the other alternatives, A, B, C, D, could be in any ordering. However, by using strong monotonicity, we can move this chosen alternative y to the top um, then, and, and don't move all the other alternatives. So then everything that was below I, y is still below y. And then everything is below y, and then we can just rearrange all the alternatives below y in any way we would like to do, right? Because that's what strong monotonicity allows. So we can move alternative y to the top here. Then everything that is below y, so these alternatives here, are not arranged in the right way as they are in this profile here, but we can rearrange them because strong monotonicity is just so strong. It allows us to rearrange all the alternatives below alternative y. And then we can just rearrange them such that we get exactly this preference relation. And therefore, strong monotonicity or repeated application thereof implies that for this prime prime profile, Y needs to be chosen uniquely. Okay, so this is perhaps like the, the trickiest part of the proof or the most interesting part, I would say. So tricky is some, sometimes sounds like a negative thing, but I think this is really where something interesting happens. Um, so these preference profiles um, or, pref or preference relations are quite different from each other, but strong monotonicity is so strong that we can just modify this relation by moving Y to the top and then rearranging all the alternatives at the bottom because everything in the lower contour set, everything below Y still remains below Y. Um, and then we get exactly this preference relation. And then as a consequence, we have that alternative Y needs to be chosen uniquely. And again, of course, this is a contradiction to what we had up here. So it is not possible that X and Y are chosen uniquely, in particular because X and Y are two different alternatives. So if, if they could still be the same, that would be uh, OK. But these are two different alternatives. And therefore, we have a contradiction here. 
And that completes the proof. So the second part shows then that strong monotonicity implies strategy proofness. And we have shown before that uh, strategy proofness implies strong monotonicity. Okay, are there any questions about this proof here? So this is just an equivalence result. So it's, it doesn't really say whether there are many functions that are strategy pr proof or not, because that's what we eventually want to know. So are there many functions that are strategy proof? Or are there interesting ones that are strategy proof? This one only shows that rather than working with strategy proofness, we can just use strong monotonicity. And uh, indeed, in the proof that we are going to do later, the strong monotonicity will make uh, some things a bit easier than, than working with strategy proofness. OK. So what we have seen now is the muller Sethothwaite theorem. And um, now, as I said, so this eventually will lead to this so-called gibbard Sethothwaite impossibility theorem, which is uh, as well known, and maybe in some circles it's even better known than the error impossibility theorem, because it's really a very sweeping impossibility. So also proving it from scratch without resorting to error theorem, as we will do in this lecture, it's, it's not uh, very easy to show. And for this reason, I'm going to show you like a poor man's version of this um, theorem, which can be shown extremely easily. So it's a very simple two profile proof. So it's a little bit like if you think about the one of the first lectures where before Eros theorem, I showed you this Condorcet May impossibility, which also required just basically showing that the majority relation can have cycles. Um, and similarly here, I will show you a negative result about strategy-proof social choice functions um, that is much easier to show than the gibbard sethothwaite theorem. Okay, so before that, so here this bullet just refers to the case that one statement that we had in lecture three, namely that monotonicity and strategy-proofness are equivalent in the two alternative case. This is just a corollary of what we have just shown. Okay, so the theorem that I would like to show you is, uh, it has no particular name, so because I just basically invented it for this course here. So it's, uh, it says that no resolute Condorcet extension satisfies strong monotonicity whenever there are at least three alternatives and at least three voters. Um, so clearly this is a negative result because like a large part of this course was focused on Condorcet extensions. So it's not as strong as it could be. So the theorem that we are going to see later is even stronger than that, but that already rules out a lot of interesting strategy proof functions because it says that every resolute function that always picks the Condorcet winner can be strategically manipulated um, because strong monotonicity, as we have just seen, is completely equivalent to strategy proofness. So how can we do this? So I promise this is a simple proof and um, so first, so this requires at least three voters and at least three alternatives. So we start with the profile, which has three voters and three alternatives. So any ideas which profile might come in handy for these kinds of proofs? Three voters, three alternatives. Yes, the Condorcet cycle. <laughs> um, so three voters, three alternatives. Maybe you can already write it down by heart now. Um, of course, there are several variants of this, but that's the one that I can easily m memorize. So this is the first preference profile we look at. Okay, and, and you know that this preference profile is completely symmetric in the sense that each alternative is ranked first by one voter, ranked second by uh, one voter, ranked third by one voter. And because of this, this symmetry, we can uh, assume, and we are now talking about resolute functions, we can assume without loss of generality that alternative A is returned for this profile, right? Because some alternative has to be returned. If it's alternative B, then what I'm going to show you next also works for the other alternative B because this profile is completely symmetric. So without loss of generality, we can assume that for this profile, we get only alternative A. Okay. Um, and now we take the profile and modify it. Okay, and what we want to show is that uh, the only axioms that we have are Condorcet consistency and strategy proofness slash strong monotonicity because those are equivalent. So strategy proofness and strong monotonicity. 
Um, but let's first focus on Condorcet consistency. Okay, so in this profile, famously, there is no Condorcet winner. So Condorcet consistency doesn't imply anything about this profile. But if, it, if we switch two alternatives in this profile, chances are very high that we are going to have a Condorcet winner because it's, it's quite fragile. And what we are doing here now is um, that we are exchanging those two alternatives. So the first voter changes his preferences from BC to CB. Um, and this new profile is called R prime. And is there a Condorcet winner now in this modified profile? Yes, alternative C is now a Condorcet winner, right? So because in this new profile, we have this majority relation, as you can easily verify. So alternative C wins. So it follows from Condorcet consistency that now in this new profile, we have to pick alternative C. Okay, so this is what Condorcet consistency says. Oops, oh, that's okay. And the other condition that we have is strategy proofness or strong monotonicity. Strong monotonicity means if an alternative was chosen and we have a new profile in which everything that was below of the chosen alternative is still below of the chosen alternative, then the outcome doesn't change. Okay, so here we have that alternative A is chosen. This is voter I who changes his preferences. Everything that was below of A is still below of A. We have only uh, made this alternative B weaker versus C. So we have taken an unchosen alternative and made it weaker. Or in other words, everything that was below of this alternative A is still below A. And therefore, at the same time, this assumption here implies by strong monotonicity that in this new profile, um, alternative A is chosen uniquely. Okay? And again, this is a contradiction. So that shows that strong monotonicity and Condorcet consistency are incompatible with each other. Okay? Um, Right, so we could have also, so if, we, if you don't, so be, now we have used that strong monotonicity is equivalent to strategy proofness. If you like, we have used this Muller's Heatherthwaite theorem that we have just proven. Um, instead, we could have also just used strategy proofness directly because if we know from Condorcet consistency that alternative, <coughs> excuse me, C is chosen from this profile here, um, then by switching alternatives B and C and going from this profile to that profile here, then the outcome would be A, and this voter here, in this column here, gets a better alternative. So he had C to begin with, and then he manipulated, and now gets alternative A, which is better. Okay, so, but both of these arguments are equivalent, because rather than taking strategy proofness, we can also take strong monotonicity. Um, so therefore, I think it's really, as I promised, so it's a very simple proof showing that no resolute Condorcet extension can be strategy proof, which is pretty bad. Um, there's one bit missing here, so which I'm not covering completely. Um, so I said that this works for any number of alternatives which are uh, greater or equal than three, and any number of voters that are greater or equal than three. So for an, if the number of alternatives is greater than three, um, we can do what we have done in other proofs of this kind before. So we can take this, these additional alternatives and write them down at the bottom of the preference profile. Um, and then, for instance, um, if, if they have, you have a bottom-ranked alternative here and it is returned by the social choice function, which you cannot rule out at this point because we don't have, con uh, we don't have Pareto optimality or something. So this alternative would be Pareto dominated, but it could still be returned. But then you immediately have a strategy proofness violation. Um, if you have numbers of voters that are greater than three, because this special proof is really tailor-made for three voters, three alternatives, you can do, you can add two voters. So because here, this is about strict preferences. So we are in the domain of strict preferences. So we cannot add completely indifferent voters. So here we make the assumption that all voters have strict preferences. So we can add two voters who have opposing preferences. So they cancel out each other. So they don't affect uh, the Condorcet winner and the majority relation. Um, but that only works for odd numbers of voters, right? So we start with this preference profile with three voters, and then we can add pairs of voters to get five, seven, nine, 11, and so on. So for odd, it works like this. <laughs> um, 
for even, it's a bit uglier, so for even numbers of voters which are greater than six, <laughs> we can take the original profile and just write twos on top here. So we just double the preference profile. So each of these voters, there are two. Then we have a six voter profile. Then we can again add pairs of voters to get eight, ten, and so on. So I told you it's a bit ugly. Um, and then we get all these even numbers that are greater or equal than six. Um, so it's double, doubling and Okay, so here I also didn't specify. Let's, let's call it cancel, because we have pairs of voters that cancel out each other. Um, the nasty part is really the n4 case, n equals 4. And that is the one that I'm not doing here, because it requires more than two profiles. Um, so if we want to prove the same statement for exactly four voters, um, then it, some more work is required. So the proof doesn't remain as simple as it was here, where you only have to argue about two different preference profiles. But it's not worth the effort into going into this in more detail, because we are proving a much, much stronger theorem anyway, um, shortly after the break. OK, but I just wanted to give you some, because sometimes uh, like people brush over these things completely. So they just they claim that something holds for any number of voters and alternatives um, that is greater or equal than three. Then they only show you the proof for exactly three. Um, and then nowhere it is explained how it works for more than three alternatives and voters. OK. Um, that's this theorem here. And um, yeah, let's discuss a little bit before the break the consequences of this. Um, so what this means is that if we look at these uh, rather attractive majoritarian functions like uh, the top cycle, the uncovered set, the bank set, the bipartisan set, so any resolute refinement of these functions can be manipulated. So even, let's say, the bipartisan set, as I advertise, it is really a very attractive social choice function. But no matter how we break ties in order to pick a single alternative from the bipartisan set, so this function can always be manipulated just because of this very, very simple proof here. And um, as we are going to see after the break, so this simple negative result can be generalized much further. So in the sense that we are still taking strategy proofness, because we are interested in functions that cannot be manipulated, but we replace Condorcet consistency with a much weaker property. Um, so do you have any ideas just before the break, so um, which property might be good to get a stronger negative result? Um, or maybe not necessarily strictly stronger than the one that we have here, but uh, as you know, there are many functions that are not Condorcet consistent, so this impossibility doesn't apply at all to, say, scoring rules, for instance, or runoff rules, or we have many examples of rules which are not Condorcet consistent. Um, what would be another property that would be nice to use in a negative result? So it should be a rather weak property. So we, we cannot get rid of this additional property um, at all. So maybe, maybe that's also an interesting question, right? If, why can we not just prove that there is no strategy proof social choice function that is resolute? Why, why doesn't that work? <laughs> that would be the strongest result you could think of, right? So there's, there's just not a single strategy proof social choice function that always returns single winners. Why wouldn't that work? So if, if that doesn't work, I mean, there is a function that is strategy proof and resolute. Yes? Yeah, exactly. Right. So we, if we always return the same alternative, so let's say we have three alternatives, A, B, C, always returning A is strategy proof. Nobody can manipulate. So you're never better off by lying about your preferences because you cannot change the outcome at all. OK, so that, that we want to rule out is a constant function. There's another example. Yes? OK, well, neutrality, for instance, would rule out this, um, this function. That's true. So this constant function would be ruled out by neutrality. Um, but then there would be another function that is also strategy proof that is neutral. <laughs> so once, once the, yes? 
Yes, the dictatorship function. So, any, so there are many of these. So for any voter, there is a dictatorship function. Always picking the top alternative of one fixed voter um, is neutral, right? Because we are not making differences to changes between the, or we are not making distinctions between the alternatives. Whatever this person has top rank will be selected. Um, but and it's also strategy proof. Um, so if let's assume that I'm the dictator, <laughs> so we are making social choices, whatever I like the best is selected. Um, so you cannot manipulate um, because, well, your preferences don't matter at all. <laughs> um, and I cannot manipulate because whatever I have as my top choice will be selected. So how can I get anything that is even better than that? That's not possible. So therefore, that would be a strategy proof function. Um, and, and therefore, um, in the theorem that I'm going to show you after the break, so one of the conditions will be non-dictatorship. So we want to rule out dictatorships. Um, and then there's still some other condition that we need, um, which is called non-imposition, but which is extremely weak. Um, non-imposition says that for every alternative x, there should be some preference profile such that the function returns x for this profile. So every alternative should be returnable under some circumstances. Or in other words, it should not be the case that there's one alternative which will never be selected no matter what. Okay, so that's, that's a very, very weak condition. For instance, it's, it's weaker than Condorcet consistency because, well, Condorcet consistency implies that every alternative A, B, C, D can be selected under some circumstances because if, it is, if A is the Condorcet winner, it will be selected. If B is the Condorcet winner, it will be selected. But this non-imposition condition is much weaker because it says that under some circumstance, every alternative will be selected, but it doesn't say under which one. So it could be, for instance, that an alternative is only selected because all the voters rank it at the top. So that would be a very natural reason for selecting an alternative. Okay, so that's, that's what we are going to do after the break. Uh, so we are proving a theory which is much stronger than the one that we have just seen. So we have just uh, seen a proof of this impossibility theorem for Condorcet extensions. And also to give you some more motivation on why looking at even stronger impossibility theorems. So the general idea of these negative results is that we want to take conditions that are as weak as possible. So now we have something that applies to all Condorcet extensions. So many functions that we studied in this course. Then we could also have another theorem that only applies to, say, scoring rules. That's also not too difficult to prove that scoring rules always violate strategy proofness. But then there are still other rules you could think of, runoff rules or maybe even completely different rules. So the idea is to have something that uses extremely weak properties, properties that are so weak that they are virtually satisfied by all social choice functions you could think of. Um, and, and then prove that no such function satisfies strategy proofness. So the theorem is called gibbard Sethwaite because it was uh, shown independently by Gibbard and Sethwaite, two economists, um, in 73 and 75, I think. And as I said before the break, so this extra condition that we need here, so that's the only condition that we don't know so far, is called non-imposition. Um, so that basically, so mathematically means that the social choice function f is on to, or it's a surjective function. That means for every alternative x, there is some preference profile r such that f of r equals x. Okay, so we only restrict attention to resolute functions. Um, and as I described before the break, this is an extremely weak assumption because it only says um, that every alternative x has the chance of being selected under some circumstances. So this condition is weaker than Condorcet consistency because, as I said before the break, so a Condorcet winner will always be chosen when, when it, whenever it exists. Um, it's also weaker than Pareto optimality, right? Because um, if, you have that, uh, if you have Pareto optimality, you can have preference profiles in which all alternatives are ranked in exactly the same way uh, in all the preference relations of all the voters, and that means there's only one Pareto optimal alternative. Um, and that way you can also enforce that some alternative has to be selected. So it's really quite weak. Um, okay, and then the theorem says that every non-imposing strategy proof and resolute social choice function is dictatorial whenever we have at least three alternatives and at least two voters. So we always assume that there are at least two voters, so that's why this is not stated explicitly. Um, so rather than this formulation, you can think of an impossibility that uses four axioms, non-imposition, strategy proofness, resoluteness, and non-dictatorship. Right? So we don't want the function to be dictatorial. Um, 
So as I said, we are going to prove this theorem by reducing it to Eros theorem. But maybe before we look at the proof, it's, uh, it's always useful for these theorems for, for both characterizations and impossibility theorems to see that all these axioms are independent from each other. So we have done this for some theorems, I think for was even an exercise, I think, for May's theorem and maybe also for Eros theorem. We looked at the axioms and proved that they are independent. And that means um, in this case, if we want to show independence, we want to find a function that satisfies any three of these four conditions and violates the fourth one. Okay? And if we have done this for every triple of properties um, that are used in this theorem, then we have shown that these axioms are independent from each other. So, well, actually, you can think of this as five properties because, well, this last thing here can also be seen as an as a condition, so we need at least three alternatives. So maybe let's start at the end here because I think that's simplest. Um, if we get rid of this assumption here, so we uh, want to have a social choice function that satisfies um, all of these conditions, so it should be non-dictatorial, resolute, strategy-proof, and non-imposing, um, but uh, it only needs to be defined for two alternatives. Um, which function could that be? So why is this assumption essential and necessary? What happens if we get rid of this assumption here? Why is this? If, if we get rid of this assumption, I'm claiming this is not an impossibility anymore. Because then we can find a function that satisfies all the conditions. Yes? Yes, majority rule. As I, as I told you at the beginning of today's lecture, majority rule is non-imposing, right? Because every alternative can be returned. Um, it's strategy proof. It's, it's resolute. Um, we can break ties arbitrarily in case of a majority tie. It's non-dictatorial, but it only works for two alternatives. Um, okay, so that means this condition is necessary. Um, now, if we get rid of this condition here, so non-dictatorship, uh, if you th see it as an axiom, um, well, this is easy, right? So a function that satisfies all of these conditions, but it may violate non-dictatorship. That means it can be dictatorial. And as we have convinced ourselves before the break, the dict dictatorial function for any number of alternatives is resolute, it's strategy-proof, and it's non-imposing. Maybe this is something that we haven't verified yet. Um, so it's strategy-proof. That's what we discussed before the break. It's resolute. Well, we have strict preferences. There's only one top choice. And it's non-imposing because whatever this dictator puts on top will be selected. And he can put any alternative on top. So for every alternative, there's some preference profile such that this alternative will be selected. Um, if we get rid of resoluteness, um, Okay, so this is uh, its a bit tricky because now here we have defined strategy proofness by only allowing to compare singletons with each other. So whenever we, we return more than one alternative, the outcomes of these functions are not comparable. So they are, as I told you before the break, so they are just trivially strategy proof. Um, so we could have a function that always returns all alternatives and then it seems like it would satisfy all of the conditions, but now we have to be careful. So uh, taking the trivial function, which always returns everything, cannot be quite done because one axiom would be violated then. So it's strategy proof, right? So always returning everything, nobody can manipulate. Um, it's non-dictatorial, yes. <laughs> it's definitely different from dictatorship, which <laughs> property, yes. <laughs> Yes, so it's, uh, this function is imposing, so it's, it's not non-imposing, so it is imposing. Um, because um, if you always return all alternatives, well, um, for we are now talking about irresolute functions, so this is, then this condition clearly is not satisfied, because it will never return a singleton. So one way to prove that this axiom is necessary would be to define a function that is like TRIF, except that when all voters have exactly the same top choice, then we pick this alternative uniquely. Okay, so then non-imposition is satisfied because there are always profiles in which all alternative, uh, in which all voters have the same top alternative. So non-imposition would be satisfied, and it can also be verified. It's not completely obvious that this function would also be strategy proof, um, but it's relatively obvious, right? So because in all the other cases, the all the other all alternatives will be returned, which will not count as a manipulation because we are only allowed to compare singletons to each other, and you cannot go from one singleton to another singleton such that uh, a voter is better off. Um, now, if we get rid of strategy proofness, so that's 
perhaps uh, the strongest condition among these uh, axioms here. We only need to have a function that is non-imposing, um, that is resolute, non-dictatorial, and defined for more than uh, two alternatives. Any ideas what that function, what, what that function could be? So if we get rid of strategy proofness, we have lots of choices. So we only need a function that satisfies all the conditions in the theorem except strategy proofness. Any ideas? So now there are many correct answers. Yes? Condorcet winner? Okay, and what do you do if there's no Condorcet winner? Uh, pardon me? The majority, the majority so, but we have more than, th than two alternatives, right? So it's, so if we have a Condorcet cycle, for instance, what do we do? So m I guess this question sounds more difficult than it actually is, so right, we can take any, so let's take your favorite social choice function. I don't know what it would be. So let's say top cycle, for instance, and then we pick, we do lexicographic tie breaking in the top cycle. Um, that is a resolute function. It's non-imposing because it's, it's Condorcet consistent. Um, it's not dictatorship and that's it, right? So we can, you can basically take any, you can also take borders rule for instance or plurality and once you have applied appropriate tie breaking to make it resolute. So any resolute function that we know um, violates strategy proofness. Um, and well, not every resolute, so it's, so all of the functions that we studied are non-imposing, so therefore that would work, but it's uh, like all the famous functions you can take, apply some tie-breaking rule, and then um, non-imposition and resoluteness and non-dictatorship are satisfied. Um, right, and that leaves only this condition here. So if we, why is non-imposing necessary as an axiom for this impossibility? So if we don't have non-imposition, um, what would be a function that satisfies strategy proofness, resoluteness, non-dictatorship, and having at least being defined for at least three alternatives? Why is non-imposition necessary? Yes. Exactly right. So we can always take alternative A. So it's the constant function that you also mentioned earlier. So the constant function is clearly. Um, not non-imposing, so it is imposing because all alternatives except this alternative can never be selected. Um, you could also do something else which, does, which is not as bad as the constant function and that is just to take two alternatives, say A and B, and then we just do a majority vote between A and B. Um, and then we select the alternative which is preferred by a majority, but we only focus on A and B. All the other alternatives can never be selected. Okay, so this is a strategy proof function. It's not dictatorial, it's resolute. Um, but it is clearly imposing because all alternatives except A and B cannot be selected. And if you have at least three alternatives, that would mean alternative C, for instance, can never be selected. And I think here it's really obvious why non-imposition is required because otherwise this condition doesn't have any bite, right? So it would be a completely empty condition here if we don't have non-imposition because we, here we require that the function is defined for at least three alternatives. But if we don't have non-imposition, we can just take a function that never returns any of the other alternatives. So we can, have, we can say a function is defined for seven alternatives, um, but only the first two will ever be returned. And therefore, um, um, this condition here only makes sense if we have something like non-imposition. Okay, now let's see how to prove this by reducing it to errors in possibility theorem. So this statement is, as I mentioned earlier, really quite important. Um, and uh, therefore, you're not only going to see this proof here that I'm going to show you in the lecture, but on the exercise sheet, there will be a self-contained independent proof of the gibbard Sethothwaite theorem. So it's, it's the tutorial exercise mostly, and there's a star exercise that, uh, that uh, asks you to prove an intermediate step for this tutorial exercise. Um, but here in the lecture, we will make use of the fact that we have already shown errors in possibility, um, which allows us to make makes the proof uh, quite simple, actually. So how can we reduce something like this to errors in possibility? Um, so um, we take a function f, um, a resolute social choice function, which uh, satisfies the conditions in the theorem. So it's non-imposing, strategy proof, um, and uh, it's non-imposing and strategy proof and, and resolute, of course. And then taking this function f, we construct another social choice function g, 
which satisfies all of the error conditions. Okay, so that was uh, IIA um, and uh, Pareto optimality and transitive rationalizability. And then we know from Eros theorem that this function G has to be dictatorial. Right? This is Eros theorem. So if these three axioms that I just mentioned are satisfied, then the function has to be dictatorial. Come on. Um, so if G is dictatorial, we can then easily show that this function F that we started with also has to be dictatorial. So this is how this proof works. Okay, so we, we have a function F which satisfies, uh, this is function F, so th and that satisfies the conditions that are stated in the gilbert Sethertwaite theorem. Then we construct from F another function G, which satisfies all the error conditions that, th that somehow follows from the, from the gilbert Sethertwaite conditions. That's the main part of the proof. And then we, we know from the error impossibility, so this function G is dictatorial, and then we go back to function F and show th that this one also has to be dictatorial, which completes the proof. So we are basically circumvent, so rather than showing directly that G has to be dictatorial, we take a fun uh, that F has to be dictatorial, we construct a function G, which is dictatorial by Eros theorem, and then we go back to the function F and show that that one has to be dictatorial as well. Okay, and uh, let's see how this works. So we first need a bit of notation here. Um, so which, uh, by the way, is also, so in today's lecture, we don't have that many definitions and notation, but I also updated this on this PDF that I upload before the lectures always. So here, this notation is defined for some non-empty subset of alternatives and some preference relation. So we are still in the domain of strict preferences. So L means linear, so strict preferences. And then we define preference relation with superscript S as the relation that we get by moving all the alternatives in S on top of this preference ranking. Okay, so we have some ranking of alternatives um, and then say the set S contains alternatives A, B and C. And then if we move A, B, C to the top of this ranking, but we don't mess around with the internal ordering of A, B and C and we don't mess around with the ordering of the other alternatives, except that we move those three alternatives to the top. Um, then this is exactly what is given by this notation here. Okay, so in this case, I didn't want to fiddle around with this set theoretic notation in order to define this operation. I hope uh, the, the verbal description is clear enough. Okay, so we have some set of alternatives. In many cases, the set S will just be a singleton. So we take an alternative and we move this alternative to the top. But also in some other cases, we are taking maybe two or three alternatives and move those to the top without changing the internal ordering. And um, we can extend this notation to profiles. So this notation is applies to a single preference relation and we apply it to a profile by just saying that we do the same operation for each of the preference relations. Okay, so that should be simple enough. So that means for every ranking for each of the voter, we just move the alternatives in S to the top. Okay, now the first thing that we are going to show is that this function f, so no, no, so f is a function that uh, satisfies the conditions in the gilbert sethard weight theorem. So f is a resolute function, it satisfies strong monotonicity, and it satisfies non-imposition. And we are showing that strategy proofness and non-imposition already imply Pareto optimality. Okay, so it's when we, when I first discussed the statement of the gilbert sethard weight theorem, I said, so we, it would be nice to only use a very weak property. So we could have also used Pareto optimality instead of non-imposition, for instance. I told you that non-imposition is even weaker than Pareto optimality. Um, and uh, here we already showed by just having a, like a three line proof that strategy proofness together with non-imposition already applies Pareto optimality. So from then on, we can just use Pareto optimality, even though we haven't assumed Pareto optimality. We get it for free by non-imposition together with strate strategy proofness. And whenever I refer to strategy proofness, now I just mean strong monotonicity because we have seen before the break that those two conditions are equivalent. So whenever we want to use strategy proofness, for simplicity, we just take strong monotonicity. Okay, so here's the proof of this simple lemma. Uh, this lemma, as far as I know, will also be useful for some of the homework exercises. So just understanding this simple step is already quite useful. So um, again, yeah, it's a proof by contradiction. Um, so we assume that X Pareto dominates Y. So everybody strictly prefers X to Y, but still Y is selected. So we can always assume singleton choices here. We are only interested in resolute functions. Okay, so if this is the case, um, then strong monotonicity implies that if we move x to the top 
in all of these preference relations that y is still chosen. Okay? Why can we do this? We can do it because x is always on top of y. So I said earlier so that we can take an alternative that is on top of the chosen alternative and move it to the top and then strong monotonicity says not, nothing changes. And here we know by the Pareto assumption that x is indeed on top of y in all preference relations of the voter. So if you move x to the top, then y will still be uniquely chosen. Okay? Um, and then we are done with this preference profile and we take another preference profile, r prime, which returns x uniquely. Um, okay, I, maybe I should drop uniquely from now on because it's only resolute choice. Um, so um, this preference profile will result in winner x and we have to have such a preference profile because of non-imposition. So for every alternative, there's some preference profile such that this alternative will be returned. Okay, so we take this preference profile r prime and um, we also move x to the top in this preference profile. Okay, x was the winner, so everything that was below x is still below x in this new preference profile. So by strong monotonicity, we have only moved the winner on top. So everything that was still below x, uh, that was below x is still below x. Now everything is below x, so this condition is trivially satisfied. Um, moreover, we can now rearrange all the alternatives below x in any ordering we want to, just similar to the miller satterthwaite proof that you saw before the break. So if, if the winner is on top of the ranking, we can rearrange all the other alternatives uh, that are below x and strong monotonicity says that still x needs to be chosen. Um, and therefore, um, by doing this, we can just mimic the preference profile R, and therefore in both of these profiles, um, alternative x has to be selected uniquely, but here we have already stated that if we move x to the top on R of R, then y has to be selected uniquely. So it's somewhat similar to the proofs that you have seen before that use strong monotonicity. So we get a contradiction because both x and y are selected for the same preference profile, namely this profile here. And therefore, we have a contradiction, and that means that our initial assumption that y is selected uh, despite being Pareto-dominated was incorrect. Okay, so Pareto-dominated alternatives cannot be selected. Everything that is selected has to be Pareto-optimal or not Pareto-dominated. Okay. All right, so that now means that we can now work with Pareto optimality, um, which is quite useful. And more generally, what we can do is we, if we have a preference profile and then we have some non-empty set S and move the alternatives in S to the top in all of the preference relations, that means that everything that is not in S is Pareto dominated, right? So no matter what S is, so if something is not in S, these alternatives will be Pareto dominated because everything in S is on top of everything that is not in S in all the preference relations by all the voters. And then Pareto optimality implies everything that is not in S cannot be selected. So if we use this operation here, then the set of, or not the set, the, the alternative that is being selected, it's a single winner, has to be one of the alternatives in S. Okay. So this is a direct consequence of Pareto optimality, because if you move everything in the set S to the top in all the preference relations, everything that is not in S is Pareto dominated. And we have to select something, so the only choice that remains is something from S. And that is already sufficient in order now to define this other function G, for which we want to apply Eros theorem. Because what we are doing now is um, we are constructing the based relation of G, Okay, so G has to be a transitive rationalizable function. So that means so um, if we have the base relation, then always the maximal elements of this base relation are chosen. So it's quite useful um, for a transitive rationalizable function to define this function by only looking at pairwise choices, then prove that this base relation is transitive, and then we can always take the maximal elements from any feasible set. And we do this by taking two alternatives, uh, some pair of alternatives, X and Y, move them to the top and see what function f does. Okay, so when, when we move them to the top, we know that f, uh, say these two alternatives are x and y, then f will select either x or y, um, and this will define um, the base relation of this function g. Okay, so we want, because by this statement here, we know that only x or y can be chosen, no other alternatives. Okay, so the base relation of G is defined by moving a pair of alternatives X and Y to the top of all the individual rankings 
and then we know exactly which of the alternatives x and y are chosen. This defines a pairwise choice, and this is the base relation which allows us to then um, define, uh, completely define this function g. Okay, so I'm going, and then we need to show that g satisfies um, the Arovian conditions. Um, so it should satisfy IIA and uh, Pareto optimality, and uh, that is what we are going to do on the next slide. But at this point, we have only defined this function g by saying what it does on pairs of alternatives. Okay, namely, we just take this pair of alternatives, move it all the way to the up, and see, and see what f does. f has to select either x or y, and this defines what g will, uh, will select if we narrow down the feasible set to only x and y. Okay. Okay, so in other words, what we are doing is we are defining G only on pairs of alternatives by seeing what F does if this pair of alternatives X and Y is moved all the way to the top. And this gives us a choice of, of X or Y, and therefore we have defined this function G on pairs. And so again, let me just repeat why it's sufficient to only define g on pairs, but we, 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 know, uh, we want to show that this function g is transitively rationalizable, so that means it only picks the maximal elements um, of the base relation. And um, for the base relation, we only need, need to know choice from pairs. So a rationalizable function is completely defined by choices from pairs. Okay, so then we need to verify that g is well defined. Um, at this point, needs to be well-defined at least for these pairs of alternatives. And well-defined here means that... Um, so if we, if we just write down this definition, it's not completely clear why only alternatives from X and Y can be returned here. So, and that is necessary for a social choice function. It can, only returns, it can only return alternatives that are in the feasible set, but this directly follows from the last statement on the previous slide. Right? If we move two alternatives to the top, the set S would consist of X and Y then, and, and therefore um, this will be a subset of x, y, okay? And therefore, this is well-defined. So it also chooses some alternatives from the subset, uh, from the set x, y. Um, moreover, um, this function, so I said it will choose a subset of x, y. It will only choose a single alternative from x, y. Why is that the case? Well, we know that this function f is resolute. It can only return x or y, but not both at the same time. So, and that means that this base relation is even asymmetric. So this is something that we usually didn't encounter with base relations, but it's a particularly strong case here. So we have a base relation that is even asymmetric. Okay, so there are no ties in the base relation. In other words, the strict part of this relation and the weak part here, they coincide except for the reflexive arrows. Okay, and now what we want to show that this function g, it's a social choice function, satisfies the Erovian conditions. But we have only specified what the function g does for pairs, but if you recall for errors and possibility, we only needed to impose these conditions um, in this 2 form where we had subscript 2. So IIA2 suffices, Pareto optimality 2 suffices. We only need the Erovian conditions for pairs of alternatives. So in the rest of this slide, we are checking all these conditions, IIA, Pareto optimality, and so on. And um, check that those are satisfied by G, so that we can apply Arrow's theorem. Um, right, so one of these conditions, so I talked about IIA and Pareto optimality, one that I didn't mention explicitly so far is the transitivity of the base relation. Um, but if we want to use Arrow's theorem, the base relation has to be transitive because uh, Arrow's theorem only applies to transitively rationalizable functions. So we need to show that the base relation which is just defined by choices from pairs. Okay? And in this case, it's even asymmetric, so it's like an tournament, so there, there are no ties between alternatives, so this base relation ha is transitive, because if the base relation is not transitive, then we cannot use Arrow's theorem. And in order to show this, um, there's a nice little proof here, which just consists of a couple of lines. So transitivity is a property of triples. Okay, so we take three alternatives, x, y, and z, and then we want to show that um, if x is preferred to y and y is preferred to z, then x is also preferred to z. We can completely ignore ties here because the, uh, the relation that we are talking about is asymmetric. So we take any triple of alternatives, x, y, and z, and see what function f does if we, take, if we move these three alternatives to the top 
of the preference profile. Um, so we know that one of these three alternatives has to be returned by the statement that we have seen on the previous slide. So whenever we move a set to the top of the preference ranking, then by, set monotonicity, uh, by strong monotonicity, um, one alternative from the set has to be returned. And here, without loss of generality, we just assume that it's alternative x. Okay, so if it's y or z, we can use the same kinds of arguments. Um, we also do the same thing for alternatives y and z. So that would be the profile where we only move y and z to the top of the preference profile for all of the voters. And again, here we can make an arbitrary choice. So either it's y or it's z, so we just assume without loss of generality that y would be returned. Okay, so because one of these uh, has to be returned, it doesn't matter whether it's y or z. So the proof arguments are completely symmetric. Okay, and just to see wh where this is going, so what this here means is that according to the base relation, y is strictly preferred to z, right? Because of this equivalence here. Okay, so if we are choosing y from this two element set, y, z, um, then in the base relation, y is strictly preferred to z. And now we have to look at these other choices, not between only y and z, but also between x and y and between x and, z and z. So these are the three pairs that we can choose from this three element set. Okay, and this is fairly simple um, because we have already assumed this, okay, without loss of generality. So x is returned here. Now, if we move x and y to the top, not the three elements set x, y, and z, um, then x will still be uniquely returned, right? Because um, everything that, is, that was below x is still below x if we move only the subset x, y to the top. Um, same here. If we take the two element set x, z, which is also a subset of x, y, z, it's the other subset, the other two element subset that also contains x, then by the same argument also x has to be returned uniquely. So it's an application of strong monotonicity where we take this as the starting point. And then um, we go here and we go here and then x still has to be selected uniquely. Okay, and that means we have now defined the base relation for um, three of these pairs of alternatives, so between y and z. So y is strictly preferred to z, x is strictly preferred to y, and x is strictly preferred to z. Okay, and if you think about this, this is not a three cycle, that's a transitive uh, relationship between three alternatives. So we have x is strictly preferred to y, y to z, and x to z, so transitivity is satisfied. Okay, and uh, so it may be confusing at some point why it's exactly x, so the ordering is then exactly x, y, z. So for it, if you have a strict relation that is transitive for three alternatives, now it's exactly in the alphabetical ordering x, y, z, even though we, d we don't know anything about x, y, z, and that is because of these loss of generality assumptions here. So here, of course, we could have also assumed that y is returned, and here it could have also been z, well, then the ordering would be different, but the arguments would be exactly the same. Okay, so this shows that the base relation is transitive. And then remaining, we have IIA and Pareto optimality. Um, Pareto optimality should be fairly simple because we already know that the function f is Pareto optimal. That's the lemma that we have seen on the previous slide. So f is Pareto optimal. Now we are arguing about g. Okay, so f and g are not the same functions. They are strongly related to each other, but they are not the same functions. And to show Pareto optimality here, we assume that we have a preference profile in which all the voters prefer x to y. And um, then, um, okay, so then we know that this, uh, okay, so then whatever, right, so for Pareto optimality 2, we need to see what for this preference profile what this function will do for the feasible set that only consists, in the, uh, consists of the alternatives x and y. And by definition, this is just what is stated up here, this we get by just looking at what f does when we move x and y to the top. Um, and well, if everybody prefers x to y, um, well then here definitely we have to select x. So you can think of this as an application of Pareto optimality of f. Or you can also use this, this statement that we had on the previous slide, that if we move a set to the top, 
um, then this something from the set has to be selected. And since everybody prefers x to y, we can also move the singleton x to the top. Um, and then, of course, x needs to be selected. So there are two ways of showing this last argument here. Um, but in any case, um, we have that on these two alternative sets, um, y cannot be selected because it's Pareto dominated. Um, so this function is also Pareto optimal. Or it satisfies Pareto optimality too. So we're only looking at choices from pairs. So we have a function g now, which has a transitive base relation, um, we, which also satisfies Pareto optimality if you look at choices from pairs. And the only re missing step is to prove that this function satisfies IRA when we have choices from pairs. IRA too. Okay, so what does IRA mean? So IRA means if you have two different preference profiles, um, but the preferences between two given alternatives, X and Y, are the same in these two preference profiles. So these preference profiles can differ a lot, but the relative ranking of X and Y in, in all the voters' preferences is exactly the same in these two preference profiles. Then the choices that, these, that the function makes from these two profiles from the two elements set X, Y should be exactly the same. So for in other words, what we choose from the set X, Y should only depend on the preferences between X and Y. Okay, so we have um, two profiles which are the same in terms of their internal ranking of X and Y. Okay, so this is the precondition. And then uh, we have this chain of equalities here. So um, first we take this function g here. So we, we, we want to show that g, so g is the function that we are interested in. We want to show that this function satisfies IRA um, for pairs. So we only need to look at the choice from this two element set x, y. By definition, again, this is just copying what is up here. We get this here. So the first equality here is just a definition. So that's trivial. Um, and um, this uh, is just what we get as a choice if we move x and y to the top. Okay, and now I'm claiming that, and this is the interesting part here, so maybe let's highlight this somewhere because this is the non-trivial equality here. This is the one where we really need strong monotonicity. So without strong monotonicity, that wouldn't hold. Um, I'm now claiming that this is the same what the function does if we take the preference profile R prime and move X and Y to the top. Um, because, um, so these two preference profiles R and R prime differ on the rankings of alternatives other than X and Y, but the rankings of X and Y are the same. So we can then move X and Y to the top. So that means the first two top choices in both profiles are exactly the same. Everything below is, could be different, uh, but then we can use strong monotonicity to rearrange in one of these, so also in both of these if we prefer, but we can, we can rearrange the alternatives that are from rank three on, so rank three, four, five, and so on, we can just rearrange those alternatives such that we get exactly the same preference profiles, and then of course, the outcome also has to be the same if we have the same preference profiles. Okay, so this is the interesting part where we need strong monotonicity. We move X and Y to the top, first two ranks of the profile are completely identical, and then we can rearrange all the stuff below, um, and it doesn't really matter. And then this, inequality, uh, this equality here is just by definition, really, okay? Uh, so this is how function g is defined, and this is just f if we move x and y to the top. And as a consequence, we get this equality here, and that is what we need for IIA. So if we have two profiles, that have the same relationships between x and y, then what the function selects from the two elements at x, y for the first profile is exactly the same in, was it, in what it selects from the second profile from the two elements at x, y. So that means we have now shown that this function g satisfies IIA, Pareto optimality. It has a transitive base relation and it is defined like this. Okay, so we um, so the only thing that now remains is that this function is also transitively rationalizable. Right? So we have only defined the function on pairs. We didn't even say what this function is doing on, on all the other feasible sets that contain more than two alternatives. But since we know that the function has to be transitively rationalizable in order to apply Arrow's theorem, we just define the choices straightforwardly on all the other feasible sets by just saying that we take the maximal elements according to the base relation. Okay, so we've only defined the function on pairs, 
we know that the base relation is transitive, and that means from any feasible set, even if it contains 10 or 20 alternatives, there will always be a maximal element, even a unique one, because the base relation is asymmetric. So every subset, there, there will basically be uh, something like a Condorcet winner in terms of the base relation here. And this is exactly the alternative that we are going to return, because then the function, by definition, is transitively rationalizable. So we've only constructed the base relation, and then from larger feasible sets, we always return the maximal elements by definition. And then, of course, it has to be transitively rationalizable. So we have constructed this function g in a very specific way, such that it is transitively rationalizable, satisfies Pareto optimality, and IIA. Okay? Now we are almost done. So it's... Uh, proof seems a bit longer than I, than I thought it would be, but... Uh, I hope so far there were, were no arguments that are completely confusing or unclear. Okay, so this is what I just said. Um, since this relation is transitive, we define this function for now for all feasible sets, but just taking the maximal elements. And now we have a function that is transitively rationalizable, satisfies the other arrow conditions, and as a consequence, we have now have that one voter, let's call him voter I, is the dictator for this function. So this function g has to be dictatorial. Okay. And we are not quite done yet, so this, this much is missing, because now we have shown that, so in, in this uh, figure of this proof that I sketched here with my hand-waving gestures was, we have this function f, we have this function g, now we have shown that g satisfies the Erovian conditions, and g therefore is dictatorial, now we have to make this step here and show that f is also dictatorial. But that's not too difficult. In, in fact, it's the same dictator. So now we have a dictator i in the function g, and the same guy is also a dictator in the function f. Um, now let's see why this is the case. So by the theorem here, and this is basically where the magic happens. So I said the gibbard satterthwaite theorem is, is not trivial or not easy to prove. And now we have made our lives somewhat easier by just uh, reducing it to Eros theorem here. The fact that there has to be a dictator for G is something that we have shown many weeks ago, um, and that, that was also quite difficult. So this is where the interesting uh, things are, ha are happening. Okay, but we can just take for granted now that there is a dictator I for function G, and now we consider a profile in which uh, the top choice of voter I is alternative X. Okay, so we we have this dictator, and this top choice is x, and now we want to prove that the function f now also selects x. If we have shown this for every profile, um, because we are not making any assumptions here, um, then we have shown that this uh, voter i is a dictator for f. Okay, so if we know that... Um, uh, Ah, okay, so we know that for this function g, i is the dictator. Okay, so and then because of this here, the function g has to return x because it returns, it's a dictatorial function, th so it returns the top choice of voter i. And um, that means that for all the, so if x is returned by this function g, and this is a function that returns the maximal elements of the base relation, it means that for all the other alternatives, this alternative is, is dominating the other alternative in terms of the base relation. So x is chosen by this transitively rationalizable function, so it's also chosen from all two element sets. Okay, so from all two element sets, x and y, x is chosen. Okay, and now we look at the function f. Okay, so the function f returns some alternative, we want to show that it's x, but we don't know this yet. So let's assume that uh, alternative z is returned, and then the goal is to show that z has to be equal to x. Um, so if z is returned, then by strong monotonicity, we can just move x and z to the top. Okay, so we take these two alternatives and move them to the top, and then by strong monotonicity, the choice is still z. And... Um, and um, by definition of G, this is also the same as what G selects from the two element set X and Z. And here we have shown that for all Y's, um, what G selects from the two element set X, Y has to be singleton X. And here we have taken one specific Z, we have moved it to the top, and we know that now the singleton Z is returned. 
and that means that this is only possible if x equals um, z, right? Because otherwise, we, we, this is not possible. So for here we have shown that from every two element set, x is returned, and here we have shown that there is some two element set um, from which, um, well, in the end, it's not a two element set. If x is equal to z, this is basically just a one element set. So in other words, what we have shown here is that there can be no other alternative z that is chosen from this set. So it can only be if z is x itself, um, then this thing is possible. If z is something different from x, this statement is, cannot be true because of this here. Okay, so therefore x has to equal z, and if x equals z, then the top choice of the dictator is also selected by function f. And now, eventually, i is a dictator for f, which completes the proof. Okay, and I know I have a feeling that I've been talking for 30 minutes in a row or something, but <laughs> I hope uh, you, was, you were able to follow this proof. Mm. So at least the proof structure hopefully became clear, right? So we had this function f, then we constructed a function g, which by Arrow's theorem has to have a dictator, and the same person is also a dictator for the original function f. Okay. Um, that shows via reduction to arrow that the gibbard Satterthwaite theorem holds. And as I told you in the, on the exercise sheet, there will be an alternative like self-contained proof. By self-contained, I mean that it doesn't use Arrow's theorem as a building block. Um, but don't worry, so it's not, so it's most, most of it is a tutorial exercise. Okay, um, unless there are any questions about the theorem or strategy proofness, I will use the last couple of, of minutes to talk about um, strategic abstention. Anything that is unclear about manipulation or gibbard sethard weight, something like that? So in general, what we have just shown that if we look at resolute social choice functions, basically nothing is possible. So I said non-imposition and non-dictatorship are really weak conditions. So it basically leaves dictatorships as functions that are strategy proof, just like Arrow's theorem. So dictatorships work fine. So if, if you want to live in a dictatorship, then at least from the axiomatic point of view, so this is, these, these are attractive functions, they cannot be manipulated, but of course they are vi violating some, some very basic conditions like anonymity, for instance. Um, and imposing functions are also something, that this is more like a technical condition, functions that we don't want to have. You don't want to have a function that is defined for 10 alternatives, but it will always return the same alternative no matter what. Or only the same two alternatives, for instance. Okay, now let's move, let's move to strategic abstention. Um, as I said, so it can be seen like, a, it's not technically, if you have strict preferences, it's not really a, like a, a special case of manipulation, but it's, you can see it like a variant of manipulation. Mm. And um, once we talk about this st strategic abstention setting, um, we again need to change the domain a little bit because strategic abstention is, is about voters that are leaving the electorate. So the basic idea is that it should not be possible for an attractive function that a voter abstains from the election and then gets an outcome that she prefers to the original outcome. Okay? And therefore, the set of voters again needs to change, as we had in the case of scoring rules, for instance, when we used this reinforcement condition. We also needed to have this domain of a variable electorate, and we denoted it by d lin star, so that's strict preferences, and the star means that the set of voters can vary. And this is essential for, for this type of manipulation, because voters are, are going away. And um, just like strategy proofness, this condition called participation, so I'm not really a big fan of this name, but for some reason it, it stuck, and this is uh, the name used for this condition. Uh, participation says that the function should not be manipulable by strategic abstention. Or in other words, um, there should be no preference profile um, on, say, n voters here such that if we take the preference profile that looks like this here, and here you can see it's the same preference relations, except that the preferences of voter i are missing, so voter i is gone now, um, and what the function returns for this profile, so this is the entire term here, that would result in one alternative, should not be strictly preferred to what the original outcome of the function was. Okay, so if, if 
uh, this condition participation would be violated, it would be possible that a voter, um, so that a voter is in the electorate and then the outcome would be alternative X, for instance, and then the voter decides not to go to the election and then the outcome is alternative Y, which this voter even prefers to X. So there would be an incentive not to take part in the election and that's clearly something we don't want to have. But I, I think you can already see the similarity to strategy proofness here. In strategy proofness, this voter I is changing her preference relation, whereas here she's just gone. She's just not there anymore. Okay, so um, approval voting and median voting, I mentioned this at the beginning of today's lecture, satisfy strategy proofness within their domain. So in dichotomous or single peak preferences, these functions are strategy proof. And by a very similar argument, which we are not doing here, it can also be shown that these functions satisfy participation. So for these restricted domains, we again have nice results in that approval voting cannot be manipulated by strategic abstention. And the same is true for median voting. The arguments, as I said, are, are very similar than the ones for strategy proofness. Um, then there's another uh, positive result here. And here you can see that this is already different from strategy proofness. So strategy proofness, as we have seen in this impossibility, is very hard to satisfy. So there are no interesting functions that are strategy proof. But there are interesting functions that satisfy participation, namely all monotonic scoring rules. Here we apply lexicographic tie-breaking to make them resolute, because just as in the case of participation, we just focus on resolute functions now, because otherwise it's not clear how to compare the outcomes. We will extend this in the next lecture when we are comparing sets, but here let's just look at resolute functions. So therefore, for instance, let's take lexicographic tie-breaking. We can also take a composed scoring rule, if you remember what that was. Um, but then again, we might still use uh, lexicographic tie-breaking, because even if you have a composed scoring rule, there might be several winners in the end. Um, so lexicographic tie-breaking is a natural method for breaking ties in the end. And if you think about functions like borders rule or plurality, they really r rarely have ties. So in most cases, they are single winners anyway. And these functions um, do satisfy participation. I, th I think I mentioned this in the very first lecture without proof. And it's also not extremely difficult to see. So you only need to see what happens if a voter goes away. So then the score vectors or the, 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 the accumulated scores for the alternatives will change but they will not change in, fav in favor um, of the voter who is abstaining. This is basically the argument. Um, okay, so there are positive examples for, uh, for participation, which makes it quite different from strategy proofness, because scoring rules are not strategy proof, but they do satisfy participation. And then, uh, uh, of course, a very natural question then is, is, are there any other interesting social choice functions uh, other than scoring rules that also satisfy participation? And here, so the picture is not as clear as it is for strategy proof functions, where we could basically rule out every social, every reasonable social choice function it fails to be strategy proof. So here for scoring rules, we have a positive result. And then we have another isolated negative result for another class of social choice functions. And for the other ones, it's not exactly clear. Um, and this other class for which we have a negative result, unfortunately, are Condorcet extensions. So there's a theorem called the no-show paradox by Moulin, which shows that all Condorcet extensions um, violate participation, or in other words, they suffer from strategic abstention. Okay, and that's the theorem here. Um, so it was shown in 88 by Moulin, who you have heard about before in this course. That's why there is no picture here, so I only used these pictures once. Um, so Moulin is a famous social choice theorist, and in this 88 paper he has shown that no resolute Condorcet extension satisfies participation. So resoluteness is really quite important for this theorem to work, but as I, uh, as I discussed earlier, so if you don't have resoluteness, we first have to define of what really is a manipulation uh, if you have sets as outcomes. And one thing that uh, is probably quite uh, um, like unusual here is that this theorem requires a relatively large number of voters and a relatively large number of alter alternatives. Right? So previously, when we had an impossibility theorem, we usually had, um, say, at least three alternatives. And in, for instance, for the gibbard Satterthwaite theorem, we had um, only at least two voters, which is like the lowest number of voters to really have social choice. If you have a single voter, well, then it's, it doesn't really count as social choice. But this theorem here, somewhat famously, requires 25 voters, at least, in order for this uh, impossibility to hold. And uh, therefore, so 
one uh, like natural question again is, are these numbers tight? So what happens if we have only 20 voters or maybe 10 voters? Um, are there functions then that are Condorcet consistent and uh, satisfy participation or are there not? And also for this number here, it would be nice to know if, if this one is tight, if we have less than four alternatives. Um, because So we know that for two alternatives, everything is fine. So majority rule does the job in basically all the cases. Also participation is satisfied. But here there seems to be like a minor gap between uh, for three alternatives. And Moulin showed that this bound here is tight. Um, so if there are three or less alternatives, you can take the maximin function, which we have defined earlier. So it's a C2 function. It's a Condorcet extension by definition. It was our, I think, our like uh, default example for a C2 function. Here we apply lexicographic tie-breaking to make it resolute, and then this function satisfies participation if you have at most three alternatives, which is nice. Um, but he was not able to show that this number here is tight. So therefore, um, this is something that we have done for a paper a long time ago. So you can think of this uh, impossibility theorem as something that looks like this here. So um, this group here is a group of 24 voters, and then the 25th voter comes and then realizes by thinking about the outcomes of with uh, him in the electorate and without him in the electorate that he's actually better off by not participating in the election. And therefore, he says, no, thanks, so I'm not taking part here. Um, but it requires a relatively large number of voters. So um, therefore, one thing that we looked at a couple of years ago is to see whether this number is actually tight um, by using computer methods. Okay, so but maybe before I show you how this can be improved, um, so this theorem here is sometimes taken as a criticism of Condorcet extensions in general. So when I discussed this border versus Condorcet conflict, I mentioned, so there, I gave you some examples where border does something really bad, and also the other examples where Condorcet extensions do something that is maybe a bit surprising. And here it also seems like this is a major deficiency of Condorcet extensions. Um, but as we are going to see next week, so this really strongly uh, relies on this resoluteness assumption. If you take Condorcet extensions that are not resolute, that can return sets of alternatives, and we appropriately define preferences over sets, then we can actually have some positive results. And some of the functions that we have seen that are Condorcet extensions, like top cycle, UC, uh, bipartisan set, are, do satisfy participation in a certain way when defining preferences over sets accordingly. But this is just a look ahead for next week. So now let's first look at um, what can we do about this thing here. Um, so we have shown in a paper a couple of years ago that um, we can strengthen this theorem by only requiring at least 12 voters rather than 25. So it's still quite unusual. So all the theorems we have seen so far only require one digit bounds for the numbers of voters. Um, and this bound, as we have seen earlier, is, is tight already. So, but it's, it's still a relatively large number, but it's like a factor of two approximately that we could reduce. And therefore we have this other figure here. Um, and the nice thing is that we were also to show that this bound is now tight. Okay, so that means if we have 11 voters or less, then we can define a Condorcet extension that satisfies um, participation. And um, in contrast to what Moulin had for, for, for this bound here, um, it's none of the existing uh, well-known functions. So we proved this theorem using SAT solving. So, it's a, so I explained in one of the previous lectures that there, for instance, where people I think it started uh, in China. So Lin and Tang first proved errors impossibility theorem using SAT solving and basically reproved a theorem that was already there. Um, and then in, in recent years, people have shown new impossibility results using SAT solving and computers. And that's also what we did here. And this getting this proof was much more difficult than it may seem because it's not really something where we just needed to encode it as a set formula and then the set solver immediately told us, okay, so there's no such function. Um, there was lots of manual optimization involved and we needed to, to narrow down the set of preference profiles that could be used in such an impossibility by what we call incremental proof discovery, so which would be a topic for another lecture at all. But so let me just mention here that this is, is not, it's not just that we can feed this to the computer and then the computer just says, okay, the bound is 12. Um, and regarding this here, um, the nice thing is once we have this computer approach, uh, we can verify which function could that be. Um, and it turns out that this is, as I said, none of the classic functions, but the function that the set solver found that satisfies participation for up to 11 voters 
in I think 99.8% of the profiles it's maximin, but in only in few profiles it does something different than maximin. So it's not really a nice function. Um, but the nice thing about with this approach is that we can impose additional axioms uh, to make this function more attractive. So for instance, maximin, I don't know whether we have ever mentioned this somewhere, maybe there was an exercise. Maximin is well known for having the problem of sometimes selecting Condorcet losers. Um, and uh, we can add an extra axiom here to say that the function that we want should not only be Condorcet consistent and satisfy participation, it should also always select something from the top cycle, for instance. And, that, and that's what we did. And that rules out selecting Condorcet losers. If you select something from the top cycle, Clearly, you cannot, you cannot uh, select a Condorcet loser. So the, the function that we found then also selects something from the top cycle. So we can add extra axioms to make sure that the function becomes more attractive. But in the end, still, it's just a computer-generated function. So what we got in the end here is just a function that is given as a huge table. So we, we can do social choices with this function for up to 11 voters, but um, you don't get any intuition into this function. Um, but the good thing is just that we now know that this bound is tight. And the other extra thing that we, that we did learn from this um, is that the proof that the sets however found, we could then retranslate to a human readable proof, because what the computer did is just check whether a certain formula and propositional logic is satisfiable or not, but then we can extract a minimal unsatisfiable set of constraints and then translate this back into a human readable proof. And the proof that we got in the end not only uses less voters, but was more intuitive than the original proof that Moulin found uh, that uses 25 voters. And the nice thing is, is that, I'm going to show you a picture of this proof, is that the proof exploits symmetries in a certain way, even though we never asked the computer to try to find something that can be um, that can be nicely represented like this by exploiting symmetry. So it was just a byproduct of, of finding a simple proof, was that this proof, um, so what I mean by symmetry here is that uh, it can be shown that uh, the, the steps that we're doing here on the left-hand side are basically the same ones that we are having on the right-hand side here. So I guess yeah, in the last five minutes, let me just show you how this proof works because it's uh, really um, not that difficult. So this proof here shows that um, every Condorcet extension violates participation, okay? And if we have at least 12 voters. So we start with this preference profile here. So this is the starting point. This preference profile is defined for 10 voters, okay? And um, the corresponding majority graph of this preference profile is this one here, okay? So it's here you can al already see that it's symmetric also if you look at the preference profile here, you perhaps can already see that there's a permutation where A, B, C, D are mapped to D, C, B, A, and then you get the same preference profile only where the voters are permuted. Okay, so this is, it's a bit like the Condorcet cycle in that it is completely symmetric with respect to this permutation here. And that's why the arguments are symmetric as well. But this will only play a role later. So here we have this preference profile and then we know that we are talking about resolute functions. Uh, some alternative will be returned. Okay, and then we make a case distinction. So there are only four alternatives. So maybe let's first assume that either alternative A or alternative B are returned. Okay, and then for the other side it would be C or D, but as I mentioned earlier, that's completely symmetric. So either alternative A or B are returned, and then the only axiom that we have apart from Condorcet consistency is participation. So that means if two voters join and they have these preferences here, so that's just a lazy way of writing A is preferred to B, to C, to D, so it's a strict ordering of the alternatives A, B, C, D, and there are two of these voters who join the electorate, um, then the outcome when these two voters join should still be A or B. Right? Because if it would be C or D afterwards, then these voters would have joined and then they would have gotten something worse than they had in the original preference profile. The participation says it should not be the case that you join an electorate and then you get an alternative that, you, that is worse than the one that there was before. Okay, so that means once you are at this preference profile here, we still know that alternative A or B are returned. And then we again make a case distinction, hence these two arrows here. So if we assume that alternative A is returned, then we take three voters, we have to check that these three B, D, C, A voters are actually in this preference profile, but that's exactly this column here. Now those three guys leave the electorate, 
case and and a was the winner if they if they leave and the outcome would be b d or c then they would be better off right because the their most hated alternative a is being returned for this preference profile here if those three leave and they get b d or c then by leaving they would get something better which is not possible if you have participation so that means if we go down here, if these three voters leave, then alternative A still has to be the winner. Okay, so A has to be the winner because of participation. But now we can look at the corresponding majority graph, and now there is a Condorcet winner. Um, so this was the original graph, and then, for instance, uh, so there were some people, so, so we want to make C into a Condorcet winner, we go from here to here. So, for instance, let's just look at the edge between B and C. So, we have a majority tie here between B and C. Now, two voters joined who prefer B to C. So, actually, at this point, we have an edge from B to C. But now, three voters go away who prefer B to C. And therefore, in the end, we have a tiny majority in favor of C versus B here. And you can do the same thing for the other ones. The important point is just C is a Condorcet winner here. And this argument using participation says A should be returned, and A is different from C, so therefore we have a contradiction um, under these assumptions here. And therefore, if we look at the other case, if here, for instance, alternative B would be returned, because we know at this point it can only be A or B, if B would be returned, we have these five voters leaving one after the another. Um, this one hates B the most, so therefore if, if these two persons go away, then it, the outcome cannot be D, C or A. Right? So they're, they're, they have a worst alternative, they go away, so they should not get something better. Um, if these three go away, they should not get something better than B, so that leaves the option of selecting D, but not A or C. So B or D should be returned, and that means that in the resulting preference profile, the outcome should be B or D because of participation. But there's a different Condorcet winner, and that's alternative A. So therefore, we have a contradiction here as well. So this is a contradiction, and this is a contradiction. Um, and the rest of the proof, we don't even need to look at, because it's completely symmetric. So here we assume that A or B was the outcome. By using this permutation here, we get exactly the same preference profile, only with voters being permuted. And then we can have the same arguments for C and D. So here you can really see that using this permutation for all these arguments that were being used here results in exactly those here. So the nice thing is, is that the original proof by Moulin, it, well, it used a different type of proof anyways, but it, it was not symmetric in the sense. So here we only need to look at, at these couple of steps, and then the rest follows by symmetry. And all of this taken together shows that Condorcet consistency is incompatible uh, with participation if you have at least 12 voters. Where does the 12 come from? So these are 10 voters only, but then we add two voters here and also here. Um, the rest is just voters being subtracted again. So the maximum number of voters used in this proof are for these profiles here where we have 12 voters. And therefore the impossibility works for 12. And then the set solver has shown that this is tight. So for 11 voters, we cannot find a proof like this here. Okay, um, so what this here shows um, is this theorem here, um, which uh, yeah, is like an, a negative statement for Condorcet extensions, but as I mentioned, so next week we will define preferences over sets of alternatives, and then we will reconsider both the negative results that we had for strategy proofness and for participation, because we will then get more positive results if we go away from resolute functions. And resolute functions at the same time also have the disadvantage of, of breaking anonymity and or neutrality, as we already know. All right, um, that's everything for today's lecture. And then, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Thanks.